Matthew chapter 4 is where we're going to be this morning. My preference would be, for those of you that may be new here or wondering, like, why we operate the way we operate, I would prefer us just to sit in a big circle to not have this stage and it, for it to feel like a living room and just to talk with one another. But, um, but you know, we kind of work with what we got. So, so I'm just going to tell you kind of a story this morning. It's not a very complex story. In fact, it, it's pretty familiar with many of us. Uh, we know the story in Matthew. We've been working through the book of Matthew. We like kind of going verse by verse. Uh, through books of the Bible in our church that's called expositional preaching. Um, it's just a way for us not to skip over hard things. It's a way for us to, interestingly enough, when you teach through verse by verse through the Bible, you start learning the Bible, which is a really cool concept. And so we just like teaching that way, preferably. Um, sometimes we'll do topical messages, but, uh, but we're covering this book because this writer of this book who actually got to spend firsthand time uh, and experiences with Jesus uh, gives us references of, of who Jesus is and, and what Jesus said. And so with that, I think it's very important for us as we as a church, as we enter into the next season of what God is inviting 1116 into, it's the season of, of what it looks like to be with Jesus and to know his voice, to be with Jesus and to know his voice. That is so much more important for many of us right now in the season of life than it is to be busy right now than to just start trying to do stuff for Jesus. Because there are so many people that try and do things in the name of God, and even Jesus himself teaches on this, and we'll actually read through this, where there are gonna be people that say, but Jesus, didn't I do this in your name? And didn't I do that in your name? And Jesus is gonna say, I never knew you. So, so to do what Jesus did is very important and can be very you know, impactful, but before we get to doing what Jesus did and start trying to serve and do all of these things and, and, and start organizations and start ministries, there is a starting place. And the starting place that Jesus is inviting us into is to just be with him, to just spend time with him. And this has been so impactful for me even as a pastor because there's even ebbs and flows in my own faith that I've been a Christian for years. I've been pastoring for about 16, 17 years. And there are still invitations to where I find Jesus just inviting me to be still and to just be with him. And so this is just not only maybe for those of you that you've been saved for a long time, you're like, I already know what Jesus' voice sounds like. I know what it is to be with Jesus. I think we all need almost kind of, if you, for lack of better terminologies, a refresher. <laughs> like, so, so just bear with me and be open to what the scriptures speak to you as we uh, navigate and work through the text each week. But my, my prayer is, is that we as his sheep would become very familiar with how Jesus speaks. And I'm not talking about your own voice in your head or especially being aware of the enemy's voice, but what does Jesus actually sound like? And we're actually going to get to hear him talk a lot as we cover chapter by chapter, verse by verse through the gospel of Matthew. And so, Last week, if you weren't here, we finished up chapter three. We saw Jesus was water baptized. We talked about why Jesus was water baptized and the significance of just baptism all throughout the scripture. Chapter four comes in. We have this really high holy moment where the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus. It's really beautiful. The Father says, I'm well pleased with you. Well done, right? And then we get into chapter four. What's next, right? Now it's time to crank up the ministry, right? Like, let's get busy. This is what happens next. Look at chapter four, verse one with me if you can. Matthew chapter four, verse one says this. <clears throat> it says, then Jesus was led up by the spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become like loaves of bread. But he, Jesus, answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, well, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. And then Satan quotes scripture, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you on their hands, bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the rock. But Jesus said to him again, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And again, the devil took him to a hive to a very high mountain and showed him the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all of these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. But then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall not worship, or you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So what I wanna do with a little bit of time that we have this morning is to 
teach you the biblical storyline of what's actually happening and to give you some references. And then I want to tell you some things that as I've been studying and preparing, uh, because God's word's alive is what we would teach in, in our church and really in the church. The, this is not just a historical book. Uh, it's a literary book. I mean, it's definitely got a lot of information, but the Bible says that when, like, the way God speaks through the Bible is that it's, it's a living word. In other words, it still can speak to the context and the storyline of our own lives and to our own church family and to our own world. And so there's obviously a, a baseline storyline that I want to teach you, but then I also want to tell you some things uh, that the, I believe the Holy Spirit's just revealed to me in studying this text that I think will, will be helpful uh, maybe for you. I know they've been helpful in my own Christian walk. And so let's look back at the text if we can this morning, Matthew chapter 4. Look back at verse 1, and it makes this interesting statement. It says that Jesus was sent into the wilderness... So the Holy Spirit's leading Jesus now because the Holy Spirit has fallen at his baptism. He's come, and the Holy Spirit's going to lead Jesus, and he's going to lead him not to go ahead and start ministry yet, not to build a big church ministry or, or something like that. He's actually going to send Jesus away into solitude. He's going to send Jesus away into a quiet place, uh, into really a barren place, a wilderness, in fact. And so as he sends Jesus there, Jesus is also Adding to that wilderness place another thing that maybe you've heard before in, in church culture or Christianity, uh, but Jesus is also practicing something considered a spiritual discipline, and it is the spiritual discipline of fasting, right? And so Jesus goes into the wilderness, but he doesn't just go into the wilderness, he goes in there fasting. And so what is fasting? Now, I, I've seen People and church people do all kind of fasts throughout, uh, throughout the years. Uh, the Daniel fast is really popular at the beginning of the year. There's all different kind of fasts that you can do. Uh, some people are like, well, I'm going to fast from social media, or I'm going to fast from candy, or I'm going to fast from soda, or I'm going to fast from uh, responsibility of my children, you know, <laughs> and like I need a break. Uh, praise God, solitude and wilderness sounds great. But biblically speaking, you don't really see any other examples like that in Scripture. In fact, in the Bible, fasting usually is just one thing, and that is abstaining from eating, right? Like, that's it. It's very, it's very simple. It's very dry cut. Um, and so you can see that example all throughout Scripture that when the people of God, uh, they would abstain from eating. They didn't just do that to starve themselves. Fasting is not some type of weight loss program like the Atkins diet. You know, like, it's, it, it, it's really something... Uh, deeper that's supposed to be happening through something physical. And here's what's happening through fasting. By not eating, which is a natural part of our day, we, we like eating, praise God, lunch is the most important meal of the day for me. I love going to lunch with people and hanging out with people, but by not doing that, it, it's not just to not do that and to like, um, you know, martyr ourselves through not eating, but it is actually to replace it with something else, and that is to draw closer to God. So in by not taking something that we would naturally want, like food, putting that in our body to satisfy our body, what we do in replace is to spend time with the Lord to replenish ourselves, to satisfy ourselves with him instead of with food. Does that make sense? And so Jesus then is, and, and again, Jesus was water baptized. Why? I mean, he, he is showing us by example the life of, of, that he's inviting us to follow in his ways, right? So, like, Jesus is doing these things to mirror for us an example of the life that he's inviting us into. And so the same is true with fasting. Uh, Jesus is Jesus. And so, but he still fasts. Why? Because he's showing us a picture of what it looks like to abstain in order to be replenished by something deeper and more spiritual, to be replenished with God's presence, and so he goes into the wilderness and he fasts. Now, because he's Jesus, Jesus is always just taking things to the max, like, right? Like he's showing us like uh, a miracle, honestly, in how he fasts. Many of us, we may fast. We're like, hey, I'm going to just fast for 24 hours. Hey, I'm going to just fast dinner time. Hey, I'm just going to even, for some of you, like, like you're super hardcore. You're like, I'm going to fast for a week. And, and, and to that, I would always encourage you as a pastor, it's like, do as the Holy Spirit leads you. Um, the Bible does teach us about, you know, like not bragging about it. It's something that we do between us and God. It's kind of more of a private practice in that, like, it's not something we should be walking around. And Jesus says, like, when you're fasting, you shouldn't walk around and be like, I'm just so hungry. I'm just out here just carrying my cross for the Lord. But that you should look like you're okay. Because you're not doing it for attention. You're doing it to draw closer to the Lord. 
So with that, you know, obviously there are dietary needs. So, you know, talk to a doctor if you need to. Like my kids have, have diabetes. And so, like, they have to be very conscious about fasting and, and making sure that they don't injure their body and by doing that. So, so use wisdom there. But fasting can be a beautiful way to draw closer to the Lord. But for Jesus, Jesus actually does it in a way that's really inconvenient. Some of us, we, we, we hurt a little bit, but Jesus is going to put his body through something that is going to take a miracle. Some people say the first miracle of Jesus was him turning water into wine. I would argue and say that this may actually be the first miracle of Jesus because he fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights. Now, I don't know about y'all, but you may be counting down the seconds for the next nine minutes of when lunch starts. But can you imagine emotionally, spiritually, mentally preparing for 40 days, 40 nights to not eat? What is the significance of that? Before Jesus is ever going to start a public ministry, he's going to actually go in private. Now, this is, a, this is something that we see in the storyline all throughout Scripture. Before Moses ever does anything extraordinary, God calls him into the wilderness. Even the apostle Paul, before he becomes that apostle that we all recognize, he goes away for three years alone. Too many people get put upon platforms because they have giftedness, because they have charisma, because they look like they'd be a great leader, but have never been alone with the Lord. And so what Jesus is showing us is, is this invitation then to, to go be alone, to go in the quiet place, but not just to go into the quiet place, just like get some R&R &R and to sleep, but to actually go into the quiet place for something very difficult, to fast. But not only does he fast for 40 days and 40 nights, but then it adds on even another seven dip layer level, right? Like it gets even more complex. Like, like just fasting 40 days and 40 nights is enough in itself. But he goes to fast in the wilderness and then is tempted by Satan. Now, for those of you that are like, man, you know, not today, Satan, or you're like praying against like, man, I just, the devil's really been attacking me. And I always tell people this all the time. It's like, you know, you're, you're praying, you're like, man, my, my dryer's not working like it's supposed to. The devil's really attacking me. It's like, no, nah, maybe you just need to buy a new dryer, right? Like, don't give, don't, don't give credit to the devil for things that might not be him, okay? So just be careful about that. I know that because we had to buy a dryer. It wasn't the enemy trying to attack us. It was just, we had an old dryer and it was a piece of junk and we just had to buy a new dryer. And praise God, God's faithful. My clothes get dry on one, on one cycle now. Praise God. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Sometimes we over-spiritualize things. But, but let me give you some other just context here because before we make ourselves Jesus in the story, which is kind of an American thing to do, uh, we need to understand this concept too about the temptation that Jesus is about to face. And that is, the devil is probably not even concerned about you. Now, we are wrestling with spiritual warfare. The Bible says that there is demonic, there is spiritual warfare, there's darkness, there's principalities, there's powers. But Satan is not omnipresent. So he can only be at one place at one time. And I doubt he's worried about me. I mean, he might be worried about you, but I, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's not worried about me. If he can only be at one place at one time, I would assume he would be with with the higher ups in the faith right now. <laughs> like, I mean, that's just my assumption. I could be wrong in that, but, but that's, that's just what I believe. And so before we just put ourselves in the story too much and just start saying like, yeah, the devil's after me. He's, he's actually probably not. There, there may be demonic things, oppression going on and, and spiritual warfare going on. But, but, and this is also to illustrate to you how significant this moment is. Because again, Jesus is doing something that we cannot physically do naturally on our own. He's fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Secondly, while in his weakness, is tempted by the tempter, by the father of all lies, by Satan himself, right? And so he's in the wilderness, and they have this discourse here, and there are three temptations that Satan tempts Jesus with, and then there are three responses from Jesus. So in your notes, just for the storyline's sake, I want to read to you 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 16. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 16. John puts it like this. This is going to help us in the context of the temptation that's about to be given to Jesus. John says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. So if I could simplify sin nature, 
Uh, I know we did a series in Galatians, and we talked about the works of the flesh, and there's like this long list of different things. Uh, there's other sins that I'm sure we could kind of have a laundry list of different sins. And, and when I talk about sins, what I mean is omission and commission. So things that we do that we're not supposed to do that God says don't do. And then also omission, uh, things that we should do that we don't do. And even the Apostle Paul says he wrestles with those things in his own lives. The things that he should do, he's like, I don't do. And the things that I shouldn't do, I do do, right? And so like in our, our faith, there is this wrestling with a sinful nature. It, it's, it, the Bible illustrates it and calls it flesh. But John is actually going to simplify three kind of funnels of different types of sin. Interestingly enough, side note, this is something just the Holy Spirit just brought up in my mind. Uh, Paul does this with also what's important about our faith in the good way. He says, really, things can funnel through three different words, faith, hope, and love. So it's interesting that there's also kind of a funnel of where things kind of funnel into of all of these other sins and types of sins through these three lenses as well. The first one is, he mentions, is a lust of the flesh. A lust of the flesh. The second one is the lust of the eyes. The Bible says the eyes are never satisfied. This is why you can be scrolling down Facebook for days, and it just never, your eyes are just never satisfied. This is why you can ride in a car, and you're just constantly just looking all around you. It's like your eyes are never satisfied. It, it, there can be a lust of the eyes. And then the last one is the pride of life. So I would argue and say that all sin could funnel through one of those three lenses. Interestingly enough, so could these temptations. Now, for Jesus to be tempted, does that mean that Jesus is a sinner? No. There's a difference in temptation and giving in to that temptation. So Jesus is just tempted with these opportunities to sin. And the first temptation is this, verse 3. It is a temptation of the lust of the flesh. To give in to the carnal desire to get what, and some would say, well, well what's wrong with that? Like he was hungry, he was fasting. And it's not even that Jesus couldn't turn the stone into a piece of bread. He could. I mean, we've seen him turn water into wine. We've seen him multiply fish and loaves. It's like the capability is there for Jesus to be able to do that. The timing is not. Jesus was always saying things like, I want to be about my Father's will. The Father's will was obviously to be led by the Spirit into the wilderness to fast. And there was obviously a set time and date for that fast. It was for 40 days, 40 nights. We'll see the significance of that in just a minute. So, so this timeline that Jesus has, it's not that he couldn't. It was just out of the timing of God. And isn't that just like the lust of the flesh? Fornication? It's not that, that's, it's not that being intimate with someone is a sin. It's the timing can be off. Does that make sense? And so for us, it's like there are so many things that God wants to bless in his timing. It's no wonder why Romans 8 says that all things work together for the good, for his good. And what is that good surrounded around? The rest of the verse says, to those that love him and that are called according to his purpose. And so his will, his purpose, his good pleasure is met around God's timing. How do I know God's timing? Maybe sensitive to the Holy Spirit in my life right? So if God's asking me to do something to abstain, then that's what I need to do. Jesus is abstaining from eating. What does the devil do? It's just bread. Almost like I could hear him talking to Eve. It's just an apple, or I don't know if it was an apple. We always assume it was an apple. It's just a piece of fruit, which I would have been fine with. I would have been like, I don't want that. <laughs> if it was a snicker bar, you know, praise God. Anyways. It's just turning around, it's, it's just, you know, and, and, we, and we minimize the great trajectory of the death of the disease of sin that wants to take a hold of our life. It's the little, but even Jesus says it's only a little leaven that ruins the whole lump. Interesting that he would use that analogy about bread there too. So this bread Yes, he could have done it. He chose not to do it. And then he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. It's so funny. Jesus is not going to give a new revelation. Come on, all the charismatics in the house. They're like, come on, I want a new word. Listen, if it's not the old word, you need to be careful because it's probably from the devil. One of the things that we can learn from Jesus and how he fights the devil is by actually quoting old scripture. <laughs> he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 8. And he said, man shall not live by bread alone. 
That's what he tells the devil. That's his response. He could have said, devil, watch out. I'm, I'm about to do a new thing here you don't know nothing about. Again, this is where we as Christians have got to understand the whole biblical scheme of the scriptures, right? We love the New Testament. We love Paul's writings. I do too. They, they encourage me. They get me excited. But everything that we're about to learn about Jesus, Jesus is going to quote to very old things. Jesus is going to quote Old Testament scriptures a lot. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 8, he's going to tell him. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He counters the lust of the flesh. Verse 5 also is another sin, temptation, that Satan's going to try and tempt Jesus with. Verse 5 says this, the devil took him to a holy city, set him on the pinnacle, and said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. And then Satan is actually going to quote Psalms 91, 11, and 12. But he's not going to quote the whole thing. He's actually going to leave some parts out, which is what he does also with Eve. See, Satan is probably more knowledgeable about the scriptures than sometimes you and I are. Like, he knows it. The Pharisees in the New Testament that Jesus is also going to have a lot of discord with um, in, the, in, in Matthew are more knowledgeable about the scriptures than most modern Christians are. Like, they had to memorize the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. We struggle, like, I, there's a lot of, and this is not to belittle, it's just the truth. Like, you know, like we remember Miss Pat, like, we had Awanas growing up at Second Baptist. We memorized a lot of scripture. And then somebody say, well, quote John 3.16. And all the little babies in the church would laugh and be like, oh, that's easy, Miss Pat. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that who should ever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's easy. Go talk with a bunch of kids nowadays. Y'all quote John 3.16. I don't know it. Right. I mean, it's just it's where, kind of where we've gone. We've, we've forgotten even the little thing. Can you imagine being a young child invited into this process of becoming what would be like a rabbi or, or a Pharisee of that day and to be like, hey, um, where's Lil' Wyatt? Lil' Wyatt, I need you to memorize the entire books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. You got it? Cool. That's your life now. It's your life now for the, for the next unforeseen future. You come back to me when you got them all memorized. In fact, there's a Bible memorization show. I don't know if any of you have ever seen advertisement for it. And, like, they'll quote a, a section of the Bible, and they don't even, like, necessarily even say where it's from. They're just, like, they'll start talking, and kids will they'll buzz in, and they'll be like, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 11 through 15. And then they'll say, quote it. And then they'll quote it. And it's amazing, and I watch that even as an adult pastor, and I'm like, that's amazing. And the truth is, is that many early followers of Jesus, like th this, is a, this, is a, this is the invitation that they were being given, was an invitation to come and follow him and to follow his word. And so when Jesus is quoting scripture, he's not doing something that seems like that we would consider, oh, that, that's a new thing, he's quoting the Bible. Like, no, like, this is something that was supposed to be a part of the practice, is to know what God says, to know the word. And so Jesus is pulling from these Old Testament references because those Old Testament references are still the word. So Satan tempts him. He says, throw yourself off. He quotes the Bible, but he misquotes. Jesus better quotes him and also uses Deuteronomy again. He uses Deuteronomy 6.16. You're not going to tempt the Lord your God. And then the last temptation, pride of life. Satan says, I'm going to give you all these kingdoms and their glory if you'll just bow down and worship me. Jesus quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. You're only going to worship the Lord your God, which is also a very familiar message of Israel to hear over and over and over again. Side note, in your notes, when you see the cross-references of how Jesus combated the temptation, all three of those quotes are from Deuteronomy. How many of y'all get real excited about studying the book of Deuteronomy? I know, right? Because we're like, well, Deuteronomy. Like, there, there is power in the word of God. I know that because I've taught a series through Leviticus in our church before. You're like, I don't want to mess with that. It's God's word. Like, we, we need to get familiar with these ancient, older texts just so we can see the significance of what they mean in the new covenant. The reason why I think a lot of Christians don't get excited about what Jesus has done is they don't understand what Jesus represents from the Old Testament. They don't understand how Jesus is the greater atonement, how he is the greater sacrifice, how he is the higher priest now, how he is all of these beautiful fulfillments of the Old Testament. You start studying the Old Testament, you start getting a lot more grateful for Jesus. 
And so as we read through the scriptures, we're going to see Jesus is actually going to quote the Old Testament a lot throughout the book of Matthew. So just be prepared for that. And I would encourage you to begin to get familiar with the Old Testament. That's why we usually will teach, when we teach a New Testament book, usually the next book we teach, we like to teach an Old Testament book. It's very strategical in that way because we want you to be familiar with the Old Testament. It's important to understand the fulfillments of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. So the devil tempts Satan, or the devil tempts Jesus. Jesus' response are always with, it is written, which is a picture for us to know that if we're ignorant then to what is written, then we will not know how to combat the enemy in our lives. But this is what I want to leave you with today, because contrast of this beautiful holy moment that was in chapter 3 of Jesus being water baptized, he is now met with this trial of temptation in the wilderness and, and almost like this self-infliction of, of fasting and he's hungry and and thankfully, at the end of all of this, the Bible t- teaches us that because Jesus responded the way that he responded, the enemy, the enemy fleed, and angels came and ministered to Jesus, which is so beautiful, right? So as you're walking out your faith, and like, I, I just want to make sure I, I teach you as a pastor, and we actually did a, a short series on this. I, we probably could have been there for months, but I, I you know, just felt like the Holy Spirit was ready for us to go into Matthew. But it's interesting that it's getting brought up again because I just want you to know that over the last couple weeks, if you've made a commitment and you're like, I want to follow this Jesus, I want to follow Jesus of the Bible, I want to follow his ways, I want to be with him, I want to be like him, I want to do what Jesus did, like you've made, your yes is yes, and you're like, I'm all in, you know, no turning back, I want to carry my cross, I want to be like Jesus, I want to just be with Jesus, I love him, love him, cool. And in the church, we would celebrate that. The band would come up. We'd play loud. Brian hit the cymbals loud. We'd be like, yeah, praise God, another one in the family of God. And then we go about our day. We go about our business. And we think, praise God, exciting. And sometimes we're not prepared for what's next. What Jesus is experiencing is a pattern for us to get very familiar with. When we make a conscious decision in faith, to surrender more of ourselves to Jesus, to follow Jesus, to be with Jesus, know that it's going to be met with pushback. It's gonna be met with trials. It's gonna be met with temptation. It's gonna be met with taking our attention away from what we wanna give our attention to. This is the natural pattern of our lives. I mean, honestly, uh, some of the practices that we've been learning with Pastor Harrison and, and, and learning like these very old basic Christian, what some would call spiritual disciplines. I mean, just go ahead, like, make a commitment this week to start fasting and see what happens. You're going to get met with so much pushback and inconvenience and like, well, I can't this week. I got sick, praise God. I can't this week because the kids got little league games and I can't this week. Oh, they called me an extra for work and I'm just going to need the energy, praise God. Like, just see how much things just start getting in your way to distract you from what you say you want to be with Jesus. I mean, just, you know, become a Christian. Start following Jesus. Sometimes the storyline is said, well, you know, praise God, once you become a Christian, it's all lollipops and giggles after that. It's just, it's just easy from here on out. And it's not true. For some of you, it actually may be even more difficult. I mean, to be an addict, get saved, give that up, start following Jesus is not easy. This is why we celebrate those kind of things. This is why the heavens should roar is because we're, we're, we're giving up our lives to follow Jesus. <laughs> That's what Jesus is inviting us into, is to die to self. That's not easy. And so when we follow Jesus, when we decide, I want to be with Jesus, I just want you to know that you're not alone, that you're not crazy. Sometimes you feel like you run into a wall. I can even tell you from personal experiences. When I was reading through this, the Lord just reminded me, like I've seen the ebbs and flows of this even in my own life, but even thinking recently, Um, of just like practicing solitude, practicing time alone with the Lord, Pastor Harrison. And you've seen me cry, and some of our other leaders have seen me cry because it's been an emotional train wreck. Like it's been crazy to say, Jesus, I'm gonna get quiet and still and alone with you and be with you and hear you and be familiar with your voice in my life. And, and, And I'm gonna come to you with open hands and all of my traumas and pains and hurts. And I'm just going to let you just start healing me and freeing me from all of that. And it's like I come to Jesus, and then all of a sudden, 
all of these past traumas to just start making themselves known back in my life again. People come back in my life again. Situations show back up in my life again. I'm like, it's too much, Jesus. Let's go back a little bit. Let's take a couple steps back. It's too much, right? Like that, that's a part of our lives. It's like this, this, this thing of, God, I, I want to I come closer to you. I want to I take another step closer to you. Jesus, I, I want to be closer to you. And then everything behind you is saying, don't go. Don't go. Come back. Like that, that's the struggle. That's the struggle. And so even our greatest example, Jesus is wanting us to show us that. Okay, he's going to prepare for ministry. But first, fasting. But first, temptation. But that he's the greater in that, he shows that there's a way out. Even the Bible teaches us that. There's no temptation that will overtake you that God's not faithful to make a way out for you. And so I want to just leave you with this this morning. James chapter 4, verse 7, just a simple verse says that resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Jesus resisted the devil, his temptations with what? With it is written, with the word of God. What did the enemy do? He left. He left. Why would Jesus open himself up to this kind of temptation, though? What, what's the purpose of this? Hebrews 2.18 says this. For because he himself has suffered when he tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Hebrews 4.15 says this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus is showing us his holy character, that he's able to overcome, but he's also, because he's compassionate and loving, is sympathizing with our temptations that he knows we're going to be faced with to show us that there is a better way. And his way is his word. And this week, if you haven't looked at the teaching notes online, I would encourage you to at least commit yourselves to read through Psalms 119. It's a long one, but in Psalms 19, it illustrates these different phrases or terminologies for what we call the Bible. I don't know if you know this, but the word Bible is actually not in the Bible. It's just usually on the front cover of all your Bibles. But the Bible actually references itself in different ways. Scriptures, um, you know, commandments, um, precepts, you're going to see him just talk about that verse after verse in Psalms 119. And then what the psalmist, what David actually says about the importance of it is written. What it is written will do in your Christian walk. What it will do in your faith this morning. And so I just want to invite you, if you'll stand with me. We're going to head out of here. But before we do, I just want to ask you, if you are making a decision to follow Jesus, and maybe you feel like, you're kind of going through the ringer right now. You're going through some, some trials. You're going through some tribulation. You're maybe even struggling with temptation. I want you to think of scriptures that you can lean into because that's what you should be leaning into is, is God's word, not in your opinion, not in my opinion, but like what does God have to say about it? And then here's what, here's as a pastor, I want to help you though. I don't want you to feel like you have to walk alone. If you don't have scriptures to deal with some of the stuff that you're going through right now, if you don't know, it's like we even were praying earlier. Like I knew like with what Ari's going through, I know what the Bible says about that. I mean like, yeah, I could just encourage her and put my arm around her and say like, well, you know, we'll hope we'll get, it'll get better. I know, I know that the Bible says, come, before, come to the pastors, let them anoint you with oil and pray over them for their healing. Like I know that, I wanna lean into that. That's not something magical that me and Harrison and Patrick just came up with, Ari. Like, we are leaning into God's word and saying, God, we're gonna, we're, we want to be faithful to your word, and we know that you're going to be faithful to your word. That's it. That's, all, that's what we're leaning into. So this morning, if you're dealing with something, if you have a struggle, if you have a trial, if, you, if you're dealing with a temptation, like, as pastors, we want to equip you with the word that, so you can have scriptures to pray, to meditate on, to ask the Holy Spirit to help you walk in freedom, and, and I believe he will. Instead of just trying to Google what, you know, a guru has said or what, you know, asking your parents or, I mean, it's not bad to necessarily seek wise counsel, but I want to know what actually God's word has to say about things. And so lean into that. And if you don't know, 
ask some pastors, ask somebody that you do that does know the word to help you find some scriptures that so you can lean into and pray these things. Praying the word of God is a powerful, powerful, powerful thing. Praying that the Holy Spirit would help us guide and walk in it. I'm telling you, it's amazing um, just to see what God has to say about it and sometimes even how it goes against what I think. But it helps me, it changes me, it transforms my life. So I love you guys. If you have any other need in the house, just know that you don't have to leave this place without being prayed for. Um, if, if you have a need, we'll do whatever we can to serve you. Again, we want to be family here. And so, uh, so just know that we care, know that we love you. If you've got little ones in nursery, if you don't mind checking them out, uh, we're leaving our nursery workers. We'd be grateful for it. Uh, but I want to pray for us, and we'll be dismissed this morning. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word that's faithful. I thank you for your testimony. Jesus, I thank you that you're holy. Lord, when Israel was given commands, they failed. When Adam was given commands, he failed. Jesus, you are the Christ. You did not fail. Every command, every law you came to fulfill, even in temptation, Jesus, you are holy without sin. Thank you, Lord, for your holiness. We worship you for your holiness today. But Holy Spirit, we need your help to be holy as Jesus is holy. We, we need the help of your presence in our life. And so God, I pray for those that are being tempted now to begin to have a passion for your word, have a passion for the precepts of God. They would be able to lean not in their own understanding, but on your ways, on your word, God. Lord, may we be a people that hides your word in our heart that we might not sin against you. We wanna know your ways, God. And so, Lord, I just pray for these people. Lord, give us a passion for your word. Give us a passion for your presence. Lord, for those that are hurting, Lord, just heal the brokenhearted. Lord, unify us together under the name of Jesus. We love you today. We thank you. And we ask this in your name we pray. Amen. You could be dismissed.